Hello to everybody. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I, I used to say this, but I'm part of the organizers, so I cannot use this anymore. So uh, I want to uh, talk about um, an exercise somehow that we are doing at Caltech, um, working together with people from Caltech, um, and we are studying the mode matching problem. Um, in, we, uh, we are trying to understand how to solve the problem of mode mismatch to the output mode cleaner of advanced LIGO. That, it, at the moment, it is not a real problem, but it will be a problem for the future when squeeze light will be implemented. So we wanted to <clears throat> study the problems because we want to try to improve uh, this problematic, problematic with uh, adaptive, uh, introducing adaptive optics. But it's not very clear how to introduce these adaptive optics. How can we correct, how can we improve the mismatch that we have at the output mode cleaners? So in principle, we, we just may say, we can say, well, uh, you just change the mode, you change the radius of a curvature of one optic, and then you are done, or just some distance. But this does, cannot happen because the cavities are all um, uh, connected to each other. Basically, if we touch a mirror, we touch uh, the feature of all other cavities, because cavities are implemented. So I apologize for very, to people who are very expert on this, but I wanted to make things a bit easier in order to be uh, understood for the, for the audience. I, I would like to be less boring possible, as less boring possible. So we all know how the network of, our, uh, of interferometers, uh, uh, how, which are the, uh, the detectors that we have in the world, but even, uh, sorry, I, I didn't, I didn't Virgo is not anymore under construction. I know, I know, I know. Um, doesn't matter. They, are, they have all in common something that is this, this layout. They have this layout almost everybody except Virgo, I think. If somebody from Virgo will complain, I think the signal is helping. It's not there. Is that true? But in principle, this is the layout that is thought for all these interferometers. As you can see, this is the, <coughs> the sensitivity curve would be nice if, uh, this is the sensitivity curve at the time of detection. Um, but what I care here is to show you that we have different cavities in the layout. I mean, we all know that we have Fabry-Perot cavities in, this, in the arms and we have the power recycling cavity here in the center of the interferometer, and we have the signal recycling cavity. This is a feature a layout in common to all of them, all of the interferometers that we have seen, even um, for, for the next uh, uh, interferometers that are not built yet. So to be more precise, <coughs> I can introduce, compared to the other uh, layout, I can in, um, we will see that there is an additional cavity that is the output mode cleaner is what I, I was carrying, what I was talking about. <clears throat> so the mode coming from the central interferometer has to be matched to the output mode cleaner. As I said, this is not at the moment a problem, but will be a problem when we introduce squeezed light. The vacuum field has to be matched as well at the output mode cleaner. Um, but there are... Uh, effects that may uh, take uh, our, um, uh, our task. It's me. So uh, we have the arm cavities, as I said, sig uh, power recycling cavity, signal recycling cavity, and the output mode cleaner. So the problematic of mode matching in general, if we consider just one single cavity is in a simplified word, we, uh, we aim to introduce a beam, which uh, can be described as a Gaussian beam, 
into the cavity that match, matches exactly the eigen mode of the cavity. So uh, this uh, the, a Gaussian beam in general can be expressed by a usual basic Q factor, complex factor. And we want to, uh, basically, we can represent the Q of the beam that has to match exactly the Q of the cavity. You see the Q of the cavity is the dashed line here that has a Gaussian profile. And those are two different examples. Here we have a mismatch, and here we have a perfectly mode-matched light. So we introduce the light exactly as the cavity requires. That's the principle. With one cavity, it's a simple problem, simple task. But we know that, uh, uh, as we have seen before, that we have uh, possible sources of mismatches that can be uh, origin originally a static mismatch or a dynamic mismatch, depending if we are dealing with mirror aberrations, torrances, uh, thermal lensing, or I. Uh, or, or a high temperature when we increase the, the power in the uh, uh, um, when we increase the power of the laser we have more light resonating inside the cavity and then we uh, have uh, higher temperature higher temperature means that uh, we have a, a radius of curvature that will change because of the temperature so the temperature will affect the radius of curvature if we change the radius of curvature, then we are changing the eigen mode of the cavity somehow. And the beam that we are injecting is not anymore the one that matches properly with the cavity. Uh, there are mode mismatches requirements that comes from study done in LIGO, and we are trying to um, make the um, to reduce the losses to up to two percent. The, the, mode, um, the losses uh, that may affect, may jeopardize the squeezing technology um, may occur in a different parts of interferometers. What we care is the losses due to mode mismatch. And the requirements are 2% mismatch at most. Uh, I just want to remind you that at the moment of the detection, we are not sure, but we, are, we had a mismatch with the output mode cleaner that was between 7% to 12%. We are not sure, but that, th those are the numbers. So we are far from being to this point. Uh, as I said, the origin of the mismatch can be static or dynamic. Uh, I want to do an exercise. We wanted to study the effect of a static mismatch, not because of the higher, not, of, not because of the temperature, because we are going to increase the temperature in the future, the, we are going to increase the power and then the temperature. But we, we had the problem with the mismatch that uh, we had when the interferometer was cold, in a cold state. We had seven, eight, 15% with just when we switch on the interferometer with a low power laser. So, <clears throat> of course, we, um, we need to study this. And because there is uh, a variation in temperature, we can work with interferometer in, with a different power, then we may have a different effect on the radius of curvature. But we have to be able to adaptively change the radius of curvature. Uh, but it's, of course, it's not only, uh, um, um, there are different kind of technologies that can be used to change the radius of curvature. This is just an example that has been produced in Florida. Giacomo can knows this very well, and the, at Syracuse University. But, but there are many uh, technologies that can be used to change, to, in order to apply changes to radius of curvature. It's not all about technologies, by the way, because the thing is, the thing is um, that when we have uh, different cavities, uh, we found, uh, we, we didn't know how to uh, study uh, the mismatch caused inside the interferometer because we, do, we couldn't localize the origin. 
Where, where is the mismatch? Is, is in the power recycling cavity? Is in arm cavities? We have four couple cavities, so it's not obvious. It's not, we cannot see the mode matching at the output mode cleaner without uh, knowing exactly where uh, and why we have this mismatch. So we found a way to represent our modes. So we described the modes in this phase space given by, on the y-axis, one over radius of curvature, which is called the focus, and, and the beam size on x-axis. So we represent the location of the modes, and what we do, we found a way, and we apply an, an, uh, an adaptive, um, we change the radius of curvature in some of the optics, and we try to monitor uh, where these modes go in this phase space. Of course, in real life, we cannot do this because easily, because we cannot measure the modes of each single cavity. But this is the way that makes, for us, gives us the idea of how to uh, face this problem. Um, we model, for example, we, <clears throat> we decided to actuate on the signal recycling uh, SR3 mirrors and signal signal recycling mirror, plus uh, a lens placed after the Faraday far isolator here. <clears throat> what happens when we do this? Um, if you imagine that when we change one radius of curvature, one step back, you see that all the modes move in a different way. The, the ideal situation is that all the modes are in the same place, in that phase space. So what we do, we are actuating on SR3, SRM, and, and a, a transmissive lens after the Faraday isolator, we see uh, this situation. Uh, we represent here the modes of the OMC by choosing a reference plane. Of course, it's, everything is with respect to a reference plane. We have the modes here uh, of, uh, of the output mode cleaner by just uh, using different radius of a curvature that are coming from the tolerances, the, uh, coming from the manufacturing, basically. We have radius of a curvature. We can measure, for example, radius of cur curvature in a certain tolerance, and then we randomly pick numbers in that tolerance. And we see that only by using the tolerances uh, coming from our measurement, we don't have all the modes in the same uh, location here. I, that's, that's an ideal situation, uh, uh, a random configuration here of 25 possible, uh, uh, possible configurations. SR3, by applying only SR3, you can see that modes are starting to collect in the same place, and, and the final result, if you apply also on the lens that we were this, uh, considering before, all the modes will be in the same place. That is the ideal situation. This is why we decided to actuate on this. But because we don't have the, the, the transmissive light, uh, the transmissive lens here after the fire isolator, people proposed me to uh, do measurement by actuating on the two already existing OM1 and OM2. And these are the final results, um, the, 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 the final calculation. Um, I consider 10,000, uh, 5,000, sorry, 5,000 random configurations by just considering the tolerances in the radius of curvature and the distances of plus minus one millimeter between optics. So it's almost nothing. It's all, all the things that we know. So I'm using real numbers here. And if you consider here the losses that we have, uh, and we have the frequency on, on the y-axis, we have a certain number of configuration here that, <clears throat> that falls in this beam, for example, that is like more than 10% mismatch just using these tolerances. So we have a, a, a big mismatch just using um, tolerances of 0.01% mostly and one millimeter uh, length variation. What happens to this if we apply, as we said, as I said before, uh, 
actuation on SR3, it happens that all the configuration starts to move on the left side, it means with, uh, uh, we have more configurations with uh, lower losses. As you can see, um, uh, configurations uh, with uh, more than 15 percent um, uh, losses basically started to migrate on the left side where we have the ideal case that should be zero. Of course, it does not happen. And if we uh, consider the, uh, the actuation on OM1 and OM2, we, we improve a bit more, but we don't reach what we want to, to uh, have. This is our goal line. Um, so I want to uh, do this. We decided to go ahead with this uh, uh, kind of study. We want to um, extend the number of configurations. So we want to uh, improve the numbers of uh, the samples has to be bigger because we don't know exactly. The, the results are not converging yet, basically. I think this is so. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Antonio. Yes. Question for Antonio? The audience. Oh, Martin. So at the end, uh, what is the strategy to correct this, to increase the mode matching, to act on the telescope or? Yeah, we didn't decide yet because there is a, a, a Rana in particular <laughs> said, we don't, I don't want to use, he doesn't want to use the transmissive optics because transmissive optics creates back reflection things and he doesn't want, doesn't want to introduce additional so at the moment, we didn't decide yet, but uh, SR3 and SRM uh, has been implement, uh, implemented in uh, the past two weeks, three weeks. So at the moment, we have two actuators on, on, on SR3 and SRM is there, and the third one is not decided yet. Think that is not enough uh, to act only on the uh, telescope uh, outside. Yes. Oh no, I think it's not enough. It's not. Yeah. Because you don't correct the mismatch between the signal recycling cavity and the arm cavities. You just correct for what no. comes outside to, and then you don't even know what comes outside. Yeah. Okay. This is me. A question yeah. Yeah, yeah, about the sensing, because you say you have, a, a, you have a several actuators to correct the mode mismatching, and so you will notice a mode mismatching, which will have different origin. Is it easy to know on which actuator you should, you should use, in fact, to correct the mode mismatching? So that's why I would like to... Not know. yet. It's not easy. We should uh, find a way to monitor, yes, exactly. which mode is moving. Uh, and I think, yes, one of the issues is really about the sensing. And the sensing, yeah. Yes, okay. But you don't mention it. But it's on the... Exactly. That's on uh, the way. Yes, okay. yes. Thank it's uh, one of the main problems, by the way, at the moment, understanding how to read the mismatch in which inside the interferometer. Yeah. Okay, no other questions, so let's thank Antonio again. Thank you. And Fabio, right?